I'm going to be talking about the maker movement, and I think actually lunch is a pretty good time for it. It is actually one of the most positive and optimistic developments, I think both culturally and in terms of uh, commercially, if you will. Um, so if you haven't seen a lot about it or know a lot about it, I hope to be the first to share it with you. So um, I'm going to talk about it uh, um, starting with this. There we go. Now, if there was a shrine for makers, this would be on the altar. It's the very first Apple computer. It's handmade. It's woodcut. It's pretty crude. But it captures the idea of its inventor, of its maker. It, 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 it is a prototype. It's not a finished product. And, and many, many of us find uh, the maker movement at this kind of stage, not the kind of stage that Apple Computer is at today. But if this shrine would also probably have a place for the laser printer. The laser printer really was what sold Apple Computers. And it brought or onboarded a creative class who had never used computers before. They wanted to they began using things like Aldous PageMaker, and they saw these, the computer as tools for creative expression. And we had never seen computers like that, or never thought of it like that. And it brought a generation of graphic designers and others into there who went from there to CD-ROMs and then onto the web. And uh, uh, you know, now that is a, a pretty big and significant thing. Well, today, I think just as they might have said in no, let's say that anyone could be a publisher, I think today anyone could be a maker. That means that there are software tools and hardware that allow you to make things that you might not have thought possible to make before. Personal fabrication is one of the terms, or digital fabrication, but it's possible to make one of something today. That's it's often what a prototype is. It's possible to iterate very quickly over those individual items. And, um, and it makes it possible for ordinary people to make almost anything, any idea they have in their head can be realized. It involves physical and digital skills, and interestingly, it also involves social skills, collaboration, and sharing. This is a 3D printed mask from one of the maker fairs. But to give you an idea that anyone can design and develop a product, which I think is pretty disruptive, this is a 12-year-old Quinn Entire who lives in LA. He started when he was 10, coming to uh, Maker Fair, and he has a website called Q Techno. He makes Arduino shields. And has them made and he sells them off his site. He has a blog, he has tutorials. And because he's 12 years old, he has a fart detector. <laughs> he knows his audience. A methane sensor that he can connect to an Arduino. Think about it. You wouldn't have come up with that idea unless you were 12. So here's Quinn at a local makerspace in Pasadena, actually, teaching adults about Arduino, a microcontroller board. He told me he was wearing an MIT shirt because he might go there someday. He comes to Maker Faire, gets blue ribbons for his exhibits and his products. He goes to industry forums. He's the little guy on the right <laughs> with all those adults talking about at an Atmel industry forum. But most interesting, about two weeks ago, we had Maker Faire Rome, and he came and gave a talk on lessons from a 12-year-old CEO. <laughs> and he got to see the Pope and meet the mayor of Rome. Um, and this is, this is his journey um, in becoming a maker and reaching out to a community of people to support him. He's not alone. Joey Hudy. Um, brought his extreme marshmallow cannon to the White House, where the Secret Service told him, under no circumstances are you to 
fire that off. But the president came up and said, does it work? And Joey said, sure. And he said, well, let's make it work. And they shot a cannon, uh, they shot marshmallows off the stateroom wall. And I kind of like this picture because it was, a, it was a celebration of science fairs. And science fairs are okay, but they're kind of boring. And the folks on the right there have their usual poster signs, and they're just amazed that, you know, Joey doesn't have trophies, he doesn't have posters, he just has the thing itself, and it works. We also sent uh, uh, super awesome Sylvia to the White House uh, to ex exhibit her color bot, uh, watercolor bot, and uh, the, pre the president got to demonstrate that. She's about 14. But she leveraged that into a Kickstarter campaign where she raised almost $90,000 to produce and sell a run of those watercolor bots. So these, I'm just picking young ones out because they're fun and interesting, but it does prove the point that there are new people able to make things because of these forces coming together. But at the core, makers are enthusiasts. And when I showed you that Apple computer. These are the, the, the enthusiasts who went to the homebrew computer club and they wanted a personal computer because they couldn't buy a personal computer and they would make one themselves. And in many ways, this is a community that wants to make things that they can't buy. But mostly, they just simply, and this is kind of what I discovered in them, that they love doing what they're doing. The root word, uh, the root uh, of, of the word amateur is to love. They are amateurs in that sense. They love what they're doing, and they'll share it with others. And making really becomes a kind of mindset as well as a tool set. In 2006, I published Make Magazine for the first time. And you know, it's, it's based on the idea that I thought people would begin hacking the physical world the way that they were hacking software. That if you learn to change things in software, you could possibly look at your car or your room and think, I, I could do things there. And this was one of the uh, signature projects in that first magazine, was kite aerial photography. And as I got into it, I found there was, a, there was a whole community of people across the web doing kite aerial photography. This one uses uh, popsicle sticks and um, rubber bands. And the idea is that the, the creator of it was a professor of architecture at Berkeley. He wanted to see buildings from different angles. You know, from an airplane, you're looking straight down. From the ground, you're looking up. He wanted to see it from 200 to 300 feet. And so he began flying kites. And what I love <laughs> is a ping pong ball. And he called it his silly putty viscous timer. Um, he jammed uh, 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 the, the piece in there and turned it. And he had about 90 seconds until it it loosened and the ping pong ball would fall and that's when he knew he had taken a shot because it only took one one shot at the time but these are the kinds of photos he was getting this is point rays up in the bay area you can kind of see him on the ground and in many ways this is a kickoff of what we're now doing with drones and a number of other things of people really trying to get up in the air and take pictures or weather balloons even but what i was doing with make and started is almost like a revival of making because making existed before I started the magazine. This is a 1944 edition of Popular Mechanics, 50 cents, and guy in a lab coat making something. And I was actually inspired by those magazines. So I researched them and found that, you know, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, they had a very broad sense of what making was. It was something you just naturally did. Robert Noyce is the co-founder of Intel. There's a wonderful article by Tom Wolfe called The Tinkerings of Robert Noyce. And it's really kind of looking at um, how, did, how did really Silicon Valley come to be? And who were the people, the pioneers, that, that settled it, if you will? And one of the things he observed was that many of them came from small towns. Noyce came from Grinnell, Iowa, a really small town. But he read things like popular science. And there's a great story in the article about he and his brothers reading about a box kite that could lift people off the ground. Well, they had to build it. You don't just read that article. You go out in the backyard and see if you can make that kite. And it didn't quite work at first. And then they tried jumping off the barn with the, the kite to see if they could get it off lift. And then finally, they dragged it behind a truck and, and got enough to prove that they uh, had succeeded. But it was somewhat that spirit of that. And Wolf asked them, 
noise. Why do you think so many of kind of our, our leading lights of the information age came from small towns in the Midwest? What was it? And Noyce said, in a small town, when something breaks down, you don't wait around for a new part because it's not coming. You make it yourself. And that's like a fundamental attitude toward life that you experimented, you tried things out, and you acquired all kinds of experience and knowledge that really didn't come through school. Now, he, he happened to go to Grinnell College, and they had transistors there, and he benefited from uh, an education as well. But he also had a lot of what we'd call informal education. So my goal has been to inspire making in, in everyone, really. And I think as a broader cultural statement, to see ourselves as producers, as people who can do things and make things, not just consumers. And I think there's something that's resonating about that. I had no idea when I started the magazine if people would be um, interested in this. In fact, I didn't even know if many people would be interested in this. Like when I started off, I knew that there were makers. When I started talking to people, they said, oh yeah, my brother, he's a maker. But at some point I began to believe, and I, I really do believe, that all of us are makers. It's something we have in us whether we develop it or not. Making is organized largely as projects, and the magazine that I publish is, is organized just like a cooking magazine would be, or a woodworking magazine, or a gardening magazine. It's around projects, things to do with technology. It's usually not so much what to buy as it is what to do. You know, an example would be to make your bicycle into a glow bike using electroluminescent wire. It's cool, but how would you know how to do it? It's one thing to see these things, but unless someone provides the instructions in how to do it, you don't know how to do it. And so I really thought the goal of MAKE was to, to spread the knowledge of how to do things so that you could figure out whether you want to make a glow bike or something else, you begin to build up a body of a knowledge of how to do that. And we set out from the beginning to make sure it was fun and cool, not, you know, truly in, the, in a sense pedagogical or educational. We just wanted you to have fun making with the idea that the more you enjoy it, the more you'll do it. And I think we tapped into that. <coughs> Excuse me. What we find, and this was a bit of a surprise from where I started with the magazine, because we started largely with a group of hobbyists. But what we found out is that they were doing most of this work in their family context. They were doing it with their family or for their family. And they were also doing it with friends and, and a broader community. But I've been struck at, at all this at making is something we do as a family. And often, to, in a sense, spur this, in 2007, we started our first Maker Fair, which was in the Bay Area um, at an old fairgrounds. And uh, it has continued to grow. And we have all kinds of crazy things, like these electric muffins um, that race around. And I could show you all kinds of things. It's fun, it's crazy. And as a business person, you might say, well, what's the heck's going on there? But it is people expressing themselves through physical things, through interacting with other people. We just, uh, a month ago, uh, wrapped up the Maker Faire in New York at the Hall of Science in Queens. And, you know, part of what I enjoy about Maker Faire is just seeing the diverse audience it attracts. It's not just geeks, it's not techies, it's families, and they're from all over, and they're participating and enjoying it. They're making things together. And this young boy saw his first robotic dog, and I love the smile on his face. And this girl saw one of the uses for a 3D printer could be to make dollhouse furniture, really small furniture for your dollhouse. And this young girl got experience making something, hands-on, doing something perhaps she doesn't get to do day to day. And this young boy made his own robot out of found materials and all kinds of electronic robots and things at the fair, including a 3D printed robot, an exoskeleton. This is called the InMove project. So um, as of this year, we have over a, almost 100 maker fairs around the world. Many are organized as small mini maker fairs like TEDx, where someone can um, set up and do this. Um, 
but it's, it, in, in eight years it has uh, grown to the point where we have almost a half million people around the world going to maker fairs. Uh, two weeks ago, as I mentioned, we had Maker Fair Rome. It was the first um, really large European fair, and we had about 35,000 people come to Rome, um, come to the, this uh, Palazzo dei Congressi. And they had, um, in fact, they had to close, the, the, uh, close it on the Saturday in the afternoon because they had too many people coming to it. And it was really a wonderful thing to see this transported to another culture, another language, and and somehow um, people figured it out. I mean, what is a maker fair? But um, someone said to me when I was there a year ago that um, they don't have maker in Italian, but they knew what I meant. And someone on this trip said maker is now in the Italian dictionary. So something you would see in Europe perhaps more than here, this is a, a autonomous goalie. So kids kick at it and the um, goalie tr <laughs> moves on its own to try to block the ball. So it was one of the things they had out there. This is uh, 3D printing Nutella. <coughs> and this is uh, from Maker Fair UK. This is a, a robot that knits knitting socks. And if you just watch your hands, it's, it's quite fascinating. Again, you could probably create one without making a humanoid, but this maker has a, a wonderful, uh, uh, did a wonderful job. And it's particularly creepy that she s looks up at you. <laughs> and this is uh, in Seoul, Korea, two summers ago when I was there for their first Maker Fair. And these are just uh, wooden dolphins that are sequenced and actually controlled through an Android phone. You can make them go faster, you can start and stop them. Just a, sort of amazing, beautiful interactions. So. You know, the, the general point is it's getting easier to make things. And in doing, in, in, because of that condition, more people can make things than ever before. And you might think it's kind of counter. Things are complex, things are hard. But software is getting better, the tools are getting better, and the communities that share both of them are um, uh, making it more accessible to more people. So I like to think of the maker movement as having kind of three dimensions to it, or three facets. One is I call zero to maker. Those are people that did not see themselves as makers today, but they want to become one somewhere in the future. Maker to maker is really the community of makers. Once you feel you belong to that community, you can share what you do and learn from each other. And then, as we're seeing makers become entrepreneurial and to develop um, uh, products and other things for the um, what we call maker to market. David Lang is, is uh, just published a book with us called Zero to Maker, and he he was uh, uh, in his mid twenties and you know had been working in a cubicle job and may have gotten laid off and he walked into a maker space and he decided that he wanted to become a maker and this was a journey that he was not prepared for but he felt he could do he had no relevant experience he was just a liberal arts major but he began using the tools and he and his partner Eric. Um, have created this open ROV project, which is for underwater exploration. Uh, and it's being now used by uh, a number of government agencies and ocean institutes and kids and, and other folks. So the maker community is a, it's a strong asset. Um, it is uh, where you can learn how to do things and see what other people are doing. Um, it is what's probably new about making. I, I tend to think 20 years ago, people talked about themselves as like the lone tinkerer, you know, the, the garage mechanic, and they worked alone. Today, they're working with other people, sometimes out of necessity. They're, they're forming maker spaces and sharing tools and expertise together. Most people that are makers identify themselves as hobbyists or tinkerers, but we also have engineers, builders, programmers, um, crafters, artists, cheapskate, um, inventor and entrepreneur. But make it, the maker community is a source of innovation. Uh, um, if many of you are familiar with open source software, I think a lot of what the maker community is inspired by is open source hardware, applying the open source ideas to hardware, sharing designs, sharing schematics. Um, uh, Arduino is probably the first open source hardware project. Anyone could really make an Arduino project. Um, but 
Also, it's about the rap rapid prototyping ideas and access to the internet to allow you to share your ideas and practices. These boards, um, our current issue of Make is it's called Board Games, and it's uh, really, there's a proliferation of, of, of boards. A few years ago, two years ago, three years ago, we just had the Arduino. Now we have Raspberry Pi, we have BeagleBone. Every uh, day there's a new board being developed, um, l largely funded through Kickstarter. Um, in Rome, uh, in Intel sort of announced that they wanted to be a major player in the maker movement. Um, they sent the new CEO, Brian Krasanich, there. I did an interview with him on stage and Massimo Fonzi from Arduino. And they announced a partnership to develop the Galileo board uh, with the Arduino team. And they're going to be giving like, something like 50,000 units away to higher education. They realized that higher education, that students in higher education were using Arduino. They weren't using Intel boards, and they wanted to sort of help bring that back. But they also saw the innovation happening in the maker community, and they wanted to be a part of it. So makers are, are generally accidental entrepreneurs. They start really with an idea, not with sort of forming a business. And the, the business usually forms around what they make. This is a story of, uh, of uh, Aaron Horowitz, who came up with uh, the idea for Jerry the Bear. He wanted to help young kids with type 1 diabetes understand um, their own uh, uh, regimen of feeding and, and uh, wh what the impact was. He knew nothing about electronics when he started. He knew very little about making, but um, through a number of means was able to start breadboarding and putting things together and coming up with models and left to right are some of the different models of bears he developed before they settled on, on one that they tested. And, and, and you know, again, this is both a hardware and a software project, but working with young consumers, these are some of the software interfaces. And you know, a, a website where they can um, sell it, but to how to manage their blood glucose levels and recognize symptoms and maintain a healthy diet with all sort of in a, in a playful mode. So, you know, this is, relatively speaking, uh, you know, a one or two person project that gets in the market without a lot of capital and without a lot of, um, you know, infrastructure to do that. Um, crowdfunding is definitely uh, becoming uh, an enabler for, for makers, um, almost obscenely so. I mean, this canary, uh, the security device, raised $1.9 million on Indiegogo. Um, and you know, the, the bizarre thing today is that you sometimes um, you start with a product idea and you get it funded and you have to go back and create a team and figure out how you're going to make that product in, instead of uh, forming a company first. So one of the big wins in the maker movement has been obviously the rise of 3D printing. 3D printing actually was patented the same year as the laser printer by Charles Hull, who, who was co-founder of uh, 3D systems, but it largely migrated to I industry, almost the way that mainframe computers were in industry. And what happened in the maker movement is, like those first personal computers, makers wanted their own 3D printer. And so um, a, a group out of a, um, Brie Pettis on the, on the right there, and um, Adam and Zach got together out of a hacker space in New York City in Brooklyn and began uh, building on an open source project and trying to make it more reliable uh, to build. And as you probably know, MakerBot uh, sold to Stratasys for about $500 million um, just uh, last spring. But um, 3D printers are allowing anyone to be a manufacturer. Um, I don't know quite how this will go, how fast it will go. Some people have, have large predictions. All I know is that we've gone from MakerBot to about 16 to, to almost 40 printers in the market from different sources. And when I was at Maker Faire Rome, I noticed that Europe had a completely different 3D printing ecosystem than, um, than America. So there was only uh, one brand, Ultimaker, that was in both markets. So there's going to be a lot of competition here. Who knows where it goes? Stratasys and, and 3D Systems are two of the larger players that have come into the market but there's all these bottom-up um, uh, players as well. So um, again, people say how large it is. You know, 
just to put it in perspective, I don't think we've sold, I don't think there have been sold 100,000 uh, personal 3D printers yet. Um, but the biggest growth in 3D printing is the sale of personal 3D printers. So I, I sort of take some of this stuff in, in, in context. It's still pretty small. I kind of think like if we were to say this is an appliance in every home, it's definitely not like the coffee machine, you know, like Mr. Coffee. It might be like a cappuccino machine, but there are millions of cappuccino machines in homes, and that's a pretty much a niche product. So, but you see really interesting things happening in a space. In Rome, this is an object made with marble dust out of a 3D printer. You know, they, outside of, uh, south of Rome, they, they cut marble and dust is a byproduct and uh, they wanted to capture that and they combine it with resin and their idea is to build objects that have the qualities of marble but in a, in a very different fashion. Really fascinating experiment. These fellows, um, uh, Chris, and, and his uh, co-founder there, uh, this was an article in Make, you know, about three years ago about building satellites for like $8,000. I mean, it's something that NASA would have spent $10 million on. And they're able to get this up in space and, and do all this kind of stuff. They, some of them actually worked for NASA at the time, but they've spun out since then and now they have a company called Planet Labs where in April they put up their first two satellites and their idea is is to have um, ongoing imaging available to people um, at a much cheaper cost and, and much uh, greater frequency. So to some degree, um, you know, the, the, the type of satellites we have going around now take a picture like uh, once in a while and they can, they can make that happen a lot more frequently. So some of the drivers here are cheap technology, meaning things like components, electronic components are are getting so cheap. Sensors, even like the fart sensor, is stuff that becomes so cheap you can put it in lots of places. The collaboration and community are important. The digital fabrication tools, you can model things in 3D. You know, when you get a 3D printer, you need to be able to design things in 3D, but increasingly there are scanners and things so that you can take objects, scan them in, and you don't even have to be a good 3D designer. There's also sites like Thingiverse where you can download objects. I don't have it on me, but it's like cell phone cases and various things. Crowdfunding is a big enabler here, where it's kind of eliminating the need for at least the first early rounds of like angel funding. And I think over time, we'll have better access to manufacturing capacity. We don't, I think, today, but I think that may begin to change. So this gives you some idea. On AngelList, there were 94 hardware startups in 2011. You know, by mid-July this year, there were almost 260. Um, you know, the Kickstarter hardware projects are 2.5 million in 2011 and 22.7 million in 2013, a 10 times increase. So, um, someone explained Kickstarter to me. I, I, I can't always explain why people put up money in advance for something that may or may not arrive for a year or so. But we're seeing an emerging ecosystem of maker spaces where informally people get together to make things, incubators where where companies and accelerators, companies or product ideas get developed. Um, we've begun doing these hardware innovation workshops prior to maker fairs in Bay Area, New York, um, to bring some of these folks together. Some help facilitate your prototyping um, services. Others are, are working on uh, workflow, uh, bringing other people into it. And uh, this is Bolt out of Boston, which is um, in some ways trying to combine a number of things that may or may not fit together well long term, product design, venture capital, and manufacturing support. But, you know, makers have sort of, you could think of making as a prototyping revolution today. It's not necessarily a manufacturing revolution yet. It's like it's easy to get your idea into a tangible form and go show people like investors or uh, even customers. But to be able to scale up, you, you tend to need uh, additional help. Makers Row is a company out of, uh, of uh, Brooklyn that is trying to help uh, on sourcing factories. Again, these ideas, like, you know, the, the world of factories has largely been a non-automated place. You call up and talk to someone on the phone and they give you a quote and they decide if they have the capacity to do that. I think what we'll see in the future is a lot more automation and interfaces, almost an API into manufacturing. And it may not even matter where that manufacturing resides, whether it's Mexico, United States, or China. So makers don't need a lot of capital, infrastructure, or deep expertise. They're innovating by um, iterating rapidly. These off-the-shelf components in the community 
you know, the, the interesting thing about something like Kickstarter, one part is raising the money, but it's actually building a community of supporters in advance of the product. It's a pretty amazing idea, working openly with others and the ability to change direction. And I think we're kind of coming up with something like a new category here of what I call make or made. And on one hand, there's, you know, sort of pre-industrial revolution, there's handcrafted things. And, um, and then at the bottom, industrial revolution, we get mass manufactured things. And I think there's something in the middle here where objects are personalized or personalizable. They're customizable, modifiable, and repairable. And uh, I, I think in some ways, some of the uh, ideas of craftsmanship from a handcrafted world may get encapsulated in software, allowing you to do things that you don't take you 20 years to do. One of the examples of maker made products are kits. And if any of you go back far enough, kits were really an early part of uh, you know, the personal computer revolution as well. The pre-Apple computer, there were lots of kits. And we're seeing kind of a, a, a lot of uh, um, examples of kits. Um, Quinn's uh, things are selling, uh, what he sells there are kits that you solder and put together. But another area where we're seeing maker made product is things like prosthetics, where you actually want things very much custom. Um, and, and what's really fascinating is some of, some of the innovation here is being driven by the users. These are amputees that go and figure out what they want their 3D printed hand to look like and they're working you know, with Arduino and other controllers uh, to make it work. And this is an example of 3D printing and I think the maker community in action in a really different way. We had this crazy idea. We want to 3D print sugar in the shape of blood vasculature. And we tried to work with a couple commercial companies, but it was hard to get um, anything, any sort of communication back and forth with them. So we turned to the maker community, and when we had this crazy idea, we pitched it to the maker community, hey, we need help to do this. Everyone said, yeah, we're really excited to help you. We'll figure this out. We don't fully understand what you're gonna use to do that, uh, but we'll figure it out together. The maker community is consistent of people that are just creatives, more or less. I know it's a very vague uh, concept, but uh, one of the big things that I've noticed about the maker community is the whole idea of um, retooling or repurposing. As through 3D printing as an abstract tool, um, you know, people are just just figuring out what to do with it, and we're exploring familiar territory first. Um, but I think that as, as the novelty wears off, um, people are going to really explore new frontiers and really find new applications for this, this kind of this fundamental idea of putting material where you want it um, in, any, in any form, in any, in any, any geometry you need. So we were looking at actually a way to formalize that interaction. It turns out that the scientist and the maker and someone in the DIY bio community, all of us are actually fundamentally seeking knowledge. And this has uh, been the unifying factor between these collaborations. So we were looking at a way to formalize that interaction. And that's how we came up with the Advanced Manufacturing Research Institute, is a way to formally bring together scientists, people from the maker community, people from the DIY bio community, and have us really learn from each other under a focused constraints of time, funding, and really defined projects. So what I'm really interested in is being able to print genetically engineered cells. What we have this summer, we had uh, four fellows come to Rice and work with us in the lab. So one was an undergraduate here at Rice already, and uh, the other three came from other places. Pretty much the moment he started even thinking about Rice, I just immediately told him, like, I'm in. Like, whatever you're doing, I'm sold. The ideal goal for an Amory Fellowship is a breakthrough mentorship, sponsorship, and infrastructure to allow makers to come in and build new equipment that we can then use for science. And this has been a, a fantastic success this year with these four fellows coming in and building a bunch of equipment, characterizing it, measuring things, reporting back to the community, posting all their designs, all their investigations back online for people to evaluate. You, know, you spend most of your time printing out you know, really impractical things, and yet here you have the opportunity to really break some new ground on creating organs, probably the most practical things. It's, it's very satisfying to like exercise a tool, um, you know, as, as, as powerful and sophisticated as 3D printing, to exercise that tool on, you know, a, a very like pressing relevant problem. Um, granted, people do need iPhone cases, but people also need kidneys a lot more. <laughs> so that's 
an interesting you know, example. I mean, they're trying to print with sugar and then they will put host cells on these structures and then dissolve the sugar after it has grown. So, and just to, uh, to wrap up a bit, you know, what, I was kind of thinking of what, if you're in the audience here, what might you do about this? What does this mean to you? Well, I think there's lots of ways to engage with the maker community. And one of the places that is very productive is within your own company. There are makers there. There are people that are doing this. Talk to them. Actually have a little maker fair in your cafeteria or on a Wednesday night or something. Invite people to bring some of the projects that they do at home that they don't do at work. And you might see a different side of them. You might see where their passion is and you might discover uh, a, a new source of, uh, uh, of expertise there. Um, we, as I said, maker fairs are in many cities and towns. Go to one, bring your family, um, bring some of the stuff that you make. Um, I'd like to see more products become maker friendly. Uh, what I mean by that is things where people can hack them and they're allowed to, in, intended to. Um, take an example of the Kinect. You know, when, when that first came out from Microsoft, it was a game device. And, and, and the maker community jumped right on it and began figuring out how to hack it, get into it, and use it for things that had nothing to do with gaming. And even pushing it into places like medical technology. At first, Microsoft said, no, this is something we don't want to see happen. But then they realized that they should back off and allow it to happen and watch it and get engaged by it. And I think it's turned out pretty well for them. Making is easier, but it's not easy. There are a lot of challenges today for makers, and that might uh, present opportunities for you. Um, makers still need to build companies um, to move from building a product to building a company. Um, manufacturing at medium to large scale is still difficult. There are still the um, uh, challenges there. And uh, physical distribution, uh, obviously, you know, if you des develop a website today or a mobile app, you don't have to deal with distribution. So some of you are probably really good at physical distribution and, uh, and retail. But I think that the biggest thing that I would just pay, uh, leave with you with is that makers are a really a, a fresh source of, of talent. And we're seeing, you know, young people really uh, jump into this movement. And, and I think this is Evan DeSantis. I get mail like this all the time. He's a 14-year-old maker living in Oneida, Kentucky. Oneida is in Appalachia, has 410 people. He says, I've been making and tinkering since I was one year old when I took apart the noisemaker in my playset. All through my young childhood, I hacked, coded, and played with any and all types of technology. Then my love for making and technology came to a turning point when I discovered your Make magazine. Before that point, I always thought that I was the only person like me on this planet. Now with you and all the makers in this world, I can make anything that I think of. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dale. I don't know, do we have time for Yeah, I think so. I think so. Does anybody have any questions out there? Good. <laughs> They're bringing a microphone for you. I have a couple copies of the magazine up here. If you want to see me afterwards, I'd be happy to give it to you if you haven't. Okay, I'm Lloyd Ivey and the MyTech Corporation, and we've been in music and since the day one. But one of the things I've become very interested in many years ago was stereolithography. lithography. And serial lithography gave us the ability, ability to take things like corn stores and all the, and there's so many things you could do with it. It's, as you said, our company, our company is a, a very large company. Oh, no, we're not a very large, we're a worldwide company, let's put it that way. But the ability to build prototypes right in our, at our desk and make, make her about come out, I immediately bought 12 of them. <laughs> and, and immediately bought 12 of them, took them a while to make them. But I will say that it yeah. is game changer. It's absolutely a game changer in our whole society. I believe that everyone will have one at home. And I know that it's changed my life, my company, and everything about it. 
and I think everybody should get into it as fast as possible. This, if you're not in it, get on it. And one of the things is we live in three-dimensional world. The fourth dimension is time, and the fifth dimension is capital. <laughs> and well, everybody should realize that is the fifth dimension is capital. The fourth dimension is time. Capital gives you the ability to move about in time. You can go anywhere you want. And uh, so this three-dimensional world we live in, we come from a two-dimensional to actually a three-dimensional by using this type of three-dimensional uh, lithography. It's the greatest thing in the world, and everybody should get into it just as fast as they can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's a um, question back there. Where's, where's the other question? Yeah, right back here. Ron. Hi. Um, Ron Goldberg. Um, have you given any thought to the ethical uh, considerations, perhaps, uh, of dangers from some of these products? Unrestricted ability to make a drone, perhaps something more dangerous than a drone? Do you, does the organization have any thoughts on that coming down the line? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of press around 3D printing of guns and, and things that are getting out there. Um, and and uh, drones are very cheap and easily accessible. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, uh, I mean, you know, to some degree there are laws and regulations affecting some of that. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, I, I certainly don't feel myself that the idea is to keep this technology under wraps or out of people's hands because of those issues. Um, people like, like texting on cell phones, we will have to learn s new social behaviors that, um, that we understand the impact they have on other people. But um, do you have any, any particular issue in it that you see or? Well, certainly, uh, certainly the, the idea of uh, invasion of privacy through a drone. Uh, there was that big story last year about someone who had 3D printed a gun. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's not going to work given the technology we have now, but it's not a far stretch to see where mm -hmm. you'd have better materials and perhaps not only just a gun, but a weapon that's yet to be invented. Um, do you see any role for regulation in this revolution? Well, I, you know, I, I, I would rather see it be light. You know, I mean, let's, let's, let's see how it, uh, you know. I, I'd rather it not anticipate the problems and see how bad, you know, they are. Um, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of fear mongering we can get and, and we end up with sort of restrictive laws. I mean, just because, I mean, what I'm really interested in is not the guns. You know, those get on the news. But, you know, when you think about drones and uh, what they're doing in agriculture, my son-in-law is a winemaker. And, and he's been flying drones over vineyards to study the patterns of growth and harvest times and all kinds of stuff that they could never do before. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's such an upside here. I would hate to see this... Uh, you know, be taken apart by kind of ham-handed um, legislation. You don't have to applaud me. Right? Yes, um, some mics up here. And I'm not a legal speaker, and I didn't stay in the Holiday Inn, so. What, what is, um, hi, I'm sorry, I'm Lee Chang, I'm Lee Wake. Uh, we, we just met, but um, what, what uh, is your view on, the, on whether present intellectual property laws uh, inhibit or facilitate making and makers? And uh, in particular, um, do you think patent trolls are makers or tools? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my background is, you know, we were talking to this on the table and I just, you know, I, I really have a pretty negative perception of patent, um, you know, patent's effect on, on innovation. Um, you know, I was, I was part of the early web, and, and I, I, we had to fight a, a, a well, I, you know, we end up fighting patents on behalf of other people that, you know, this is technology was in the public domain. And, um, you know, we did it and we didn't patent it. And, and it's just because we were sharing it. And then someone came along two years later and patented it, and then went and sued a bunch of people. And what we learned in that, this is 1993, and the fellow that got the patent was 1994, 95. And we learned that the, the trademark, um, the PTO, 
was not allowed to do research on the internet until after 95. So they were granting patents about the internet without even being on the internet themselves, which is pretty outrageous. But I, I, I would say that I come more from the open source community and sort of the idea of sharing. It's, it's not an enforced thing or a required thing if people want to be, in some ways what we've seen is the default for invention today in, in, some, in this maker community is to share and worry later um, rather than protect and hold on to things. Um, and I think people are, are doing pretty well with that. Uh, but I think, um, you know, this 3D printing is an example of, um, it's, I think when it's, what the problem is there's a lack of clarity around what these patents are because, I mean, the, the original 3D systems patents date to 1986 and they've, they start expiring, but they get wound up in subsequent patents and nobody can be quite clear if, uh, you know, a group of MIT students can go in a garage and build that printer. You know, not, not the one we saw, but these resin printers and some others. Uh, so um, it, is, it is sort of a, a morass. And I actually think one of the reasons MakerBot was, was acquired was had to do with intellectual property protection more than anything else. And, and obviously they made money. Any other? It's a legal group here. <laughs> I, w I will say, yeah, so go on, the back. Thank you. Uh, Ross Rubin, uh, Principal Analyst, Radical Research. You talked about uh, commercialization uh, as one of the obstacles or forming companies, uh, not just products. Uh, how, how common uh, is that among the maker community? Is there an idea that it would be great to do this avocation of mine uh, as a, yeah. a full-time job? And, and in many cases, are what they're creating even viable as commercial products? Well, I think you know, that's why I call them accidental entrepreneurs. I don't think they start off with this. And one of the things that happens like at Maker Faire, people come up and say, hey, can I buy that? And you're like, I never thought of making it just for sale. So they have to go back and figure that out. Um, but someone once said to me, that just, you know, the, the making becomes the core and then they end up having to build a business around that. And, you know, whether it's shipping and logistics or, you know, customer support, these are all new things for them. I think there are some places where those will be aggregated and someone says, I'm, I'm just going to make the products and and I'll license them to someone else. But it's about, um, my, my census from our studies is about 20 to 25 percent of the makers are interested in doing this. I think, you know, there, there's certainly, you know, a lot of people when they're amateurs like to, like to keep being an amateur. Um, but there certainly are a number of opportunities and I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the insights here is that, uh, particularly for engineers, um, engineer, engineering is becoming a profession that you can practice independently, like as a freelancer. You can do this without necessarily a big lab or lots of resources. And I think that's going to open up some new talent and new ideas. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I have one more question. Where, where are you? Yeah. Oh, oh there Hi. you are. I'm Joellen Gray, Director of Marketing at Fujifilm. You started your presentation talking a lot about the spirit of inspiration and creativity right. that's inherent in a maker. And then the presentation talked a lot about physical object and invention. But where do you personally define a maker? Is it someone who would create a video game? Is it someone who uses software? Sure. H how do you see it evolving over time? Well, I, I think those are all, um, uh, you know, digital making or, you know, software, uh, writing programs, writing games. It's all making. I think I was more focused a bit on physical because I, I felt nobody else was. <laughs> you know, that we were losing this, you know, that everything would just be on a computer. And, and yet, you know, the idea was you could build applications, you know, that have sensors in a room. You could build applications that spread across a city. Um, if you're doing air quality monitoring, um, that is an application. And how many points of sensors can you get out there to do that? So I think it's just, you know, uh, in a funny way, it's just a, a point of emphasis that's different, but I, it is accessible and meaningful for, for anyone, regardless of what the skills are. And a lot of, I think a lot of the d new developments in making will come from the software side. The, the biggest challenges we have with 3D printers is probably not the hardware today, it's the software. It's kind of cumbersome and a little bit hard to use, so we'll get better at that. I'm going to leave you with one thought, if I can. 
I think the most important thing the maker movement is doing today, which I didn't really talk about in the science, is, is I think it's having an impact on education. Um, it's trying to reintroduce hands-on learning and experiential learning into kids' lives, whether that's through school or not. Um, kids love to do this, and they want more of it, but they can't find it in their communities. And so um, I set up a maker education initiative last year to try to um, uh, work with places like science centers and Girl Scout troops and other places to um, engage more kids as makers. But um, I think it's a, it's a big deal uh, to get more kids engaged. And I think there's a lot of talent out there that isn't developed uh, adequately in our school systems. So thank you very much for having me today. It was a pleasure talking to you.